Today we're going to read from Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn there. It's going to be a short message today. Short message. Now, just real quick, next week we are going to start a brand new sermon series next weekend. It's called The Great Spelunking Adventure. Who knows what spelunking means? What spelunking is? It's what? Cave, cave do, quick, um, exploring caves, right? Um, we are going to explore some biblical caves. Some great things happened to God's men and women while they were in caves on mountains. And so we are going to go poking around, exploring some of these caves and see what God will teach us through their experience and what we read in the scripture. So I think it'll be a lot of fun and I'm excited about it. So don't miss it. It starts next week. This week, we're going to talk about love. Everybody say love. Love at, well, don't clap yet. Um, (laughs) um, Love and forgiveness. Amen. Amen. But I found out last night when I preached this sermon, it was a little more revealing about my character than it was about anybody else's character. Um, And I thought, well, maybe I'll preach this different today because, you know, I don't want to be quite as transparent on Sunday mornings, you know, this is like religious (laughs) church. Um, But... uh, but oh well, we'll just let it, we'll let it fly. <laughs> let's, let's read this and then you'll get the gist of what I'm, uh, we're going to talk about. This is uh, verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 43. It, this is Jesus talking. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, oh yea, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. Undoubtedly, my least favorite passage of Scripture in all the Bible. (laughs) I say this a lot. Whatever I'm studying that week, whatever I'm going to preach about, that's usually my favorite passage of Scripture, but I can tell you without a doubt, that's my least favorite passage of Scripture. Jesus telling us that I'm the only heathen in the crowd, I'm assuming. I found that out last night, too. They're all like, Pastor Dave, am I the only one that doesn't like that passage of Scripture? Love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. My goodness, that's a tough pill to swallow. That's difficult. Jesus here is, this is the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is is telling us what the kingdom of God is like. And we find out that the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. You hear me talk about that a lot. It's an upside-down kingdom. Things are upside-down. They're reversed. They're opposite of what we would be used to here on earth, in our world, in our kingdoms. Things are just turned around. They're opposite. God's ways are not our ways. His kingdom's not our kingdom. His thoughts are not our thoughts, right? So things are just a little bit different. They're upside down. They're not normal. I mean, think about it. If you want to live, you got to die. That ain't normal. If you want want to be rich, you got to be poor. Again, a little off. In God's kingdom, the meek shall inherit the earth. That doesn't make any sense. And so Jesus here lays out this kingdom that looks nothing like what we're used to, where the rules that apply to here on earth and our kingdoms don't apply in God's kingdom. And no greater example of that exists than what we just read in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus tells us to love our enemies, to bless those that curse us, to do good to those who mean harm to us. What a radical concept of love. What a radical concept that is. And, and, and here's the thing, I think when we talk about love as Christians, I, I think we like to pick and choose our scriptures, don't we? we? We like 1 John. If you read 1 John, it talks about God is love. We like that, don't, you? don't we? Hallelujah. Or, or 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul. Love is patient. Love is kind. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, you're all good. Just wait. You ain't going to give me so many amens in a minute. Um, so we're okay with that stuff. We'll take it. 
but this love your enemy, bless those that curse you. I don't know that we're all that into that. I mean, come on, bless those that say bad things about you. I'd rather just say something worse about them. <laughs> do, do good to those who hate me. I want to get as far away from those who hate me as possible. Pray for those who use me and persecute me and have bad, evil intentions for me. Ah, that's just hard. That's a hard pill to swallow. That's like Superman taking Zod out for tea instead of destroying Metropolis to stop him. Yes. Just destroy Metropolis just a little bit. A little bit. Anyway, <laughs> if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so Jesus here lays this this idea of love out that just contradicts everything that, that's natural to us. And, and when you study love, what you find out is that it's, through the scripture, it's full of contradictions. It's full of conflict. That, that verse in, in verse, 1 John, that passage, it says, um, love, if you love one another, then you'll know God. But if you love the world, then the love of God can't be in you. It's a contradiction, a conflict. It's like the opposite side of the coin. For even the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians, he says, love is patient, love is kind, but love is not vain. It's not jealous, two sides of the coin. Here, Jesus, the very guy who said love your neighbor, says, yeah, love your neighbor, that's pretty cool, but that isn't the real test of love. The real test of love is if you love those who do bad things to you. That's how you display the love of the Father. Again, another conflict, another contradiction. He's telling us something that goes completely against our character. Something that goes completely against how we're wired, how our world works. But here's what I want you to know right at the beginning. Hidden in these statements that Jesus makes lies the key. The key to unlock real peace, real joy, real contentment, real release in your life. The keys to really walking out a true walk with Jesus. Listen, God wouldn't impose such a lofty requirement on us that goes so completely against our nature just to mess with us. He wouldn't do it just to annoy us and make us mad. You see, Jesus knows that there's life in these principles. That's why he's saying it. He knows that there's freedom, that there's liberty. But it, and it's not easy, come on. It's not easy. I can think of lots of bad stuff to do to my enemies. <laughs> One other person's with me. The rest of you are all very godly. Nalani and I are both going to hell together. <laughs> Man, um, <laughs> I, can, I, can think of, I, I can think of bad stuff to say about my enemies. I'd rather say bad stuff than actually do bad stuff. <laughs> I can go to bed and just run the tape, man, all the stuff I want to say to all the people that said that done bad things to me. Am I the only one? My goodness. Man. And here's where it really gets challenging for me. Um, that, last, that last statement Jesus makes, he says, be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. I think that word perfect there is mistranslated. If you do a word study, I think a better word for that Greek word would have been the word mature. Mature or complete. So if you read it like that, it's be mature like your Father in heaven is mature. So the mark of a mature Christian, the mark of a mature follower of Christ is loving your enemy and blessing those that curse you. Now, that doesn't bode well for your pastor's spiritual maturity, I guess, um, because I struggle with this. But this is the mark of a person who is really living the life of a true follower of Christ. Loving your enemy. And how do we do this? Listen, it's difficult. Okay, and I know last night we had springboard. And I don't know all their stories. My wife didn't tell me all their stories. But I can assume last night there's some pretty horrific stories represented by that group of young ladies that was, were here. Bad stuff that have been done. Maybe you're here and you think, Pastor Dave, there's no, you don't understand. You don't know the depth of the hurt. You don't know the depth of the betrayal, the depth of the rejection that I have faced. 
You don't know how bad the hurt is, how, how, how bad the, the rejection is. And, and trust me, I, I'm not minimizing those things, but somehow we have to get this principle and make it a part of our character and our nature. Somehow we have to have this upside down kingdom of God. It has to invade our kingdom. Do you know what I'm saying? Amen. So we got to learn to love upside down. So that's the name of the sermon, love upside down. Now, here's the first thing I think we got to wrestle with. My little clock fell down. Can we move that up so I know where we're at? Don't want to keep everybody here till 2, just 1.30. Come on. <laughs> Here's the first thing. Loving in this manner, in this upside down manner, is not optional. Amen. It's not optional. The scripture here is clear. If we want to be children of the Father, we must love our enemies. If we do not love our enemies, then we're not children of the Father. A pretty heavy statement, isn't it? It says it right there in verse 45 after Jesus says everything. He says, that you may be sons of your Father. So what he means there is that if we say we're followers of Jesus, if we say we're Christians, if we say we love people and yet we don't love our enemies, we're liars, we're hypocrites, we're not telling the truth. That's a pretty tough pill to swallow, isn't it? We must love our enemies. And here, here's why I struggle with it so much. And, and some of you will, will, I've preached on this and exposed myself in this area before. Um, I want to see justice done. How many of you are with me? I, not only do I want to see justice done, I want to be the purveyor of justice. I want to be the one that brings the justice. You know what I'm talking about? Um, that, that's just how I'm wired. But you know what? At some point, All of us have to realize that God is the better purveyor of justice than we are. That that God is the better judge than we are. That he's the more righteous judge than we are. The key here is to trust God. That he ultimately will make everything right. And you know what? The scripture bears that out. Jesus says, um, that, that he makes, it, he makes his, his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What's that telling us? It's telling us that God is good, he's in control, and ultimately he'll dole out the justice in a, in a righteous and just way. Right? And it goes right to one of our core statements here at CCA, which is you have to believe God is good and he has your best interest at heart. Amen. That he ultimately makes everything Right, we may not understand it, our flesh may say, our emotions may say something, our flesh may say something, but we have to trust that God is in control and he is the better purveyor of justice than we are. Turn quickly in your Bibles to to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse, we'll we'll read from verse 17. In order really to make this point, we have to read the scripture. This is the Apostle Paul here in Romans talking. He says, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now we're talking. Um, now we're speaking my language there. Um, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. The apostle Paul is saying, you know what? God is the better judge than you are. He is the pr- better purveyor of justice. And, and it goes a step further. Don't just love them, but meet their needs. Amen. Wow. How many of you have ever prayed for your enemy? Not just that God would heap coals of fire on the head. <laughs> But really pray, God, meet their need. I don't think this person would be um, upset at me for sharing this, but I was talking with Michael Padgett last night, and he was talking about how his motorcycle got stolen, right? And he was actually there, saw the dude take off with his motorcycle. And then uh, he was asking, he asked Peter Smith to pray for him like a, a day later. And Peter Smith said, Lord, we pray that that guy that stole his motorcycle would be blessed. Yeah. And he's like, I didn't know how to feel about that, Pastor Dave. I'm like, I got you. I was looking for the coals of fire to heap on his head. Um, now, what, 
what does this heaping coals of fire thing mean? There's a lot, of, a lot of people that have lots of opinions about that. My feeling is that, you know what, when you heap coals of kindness, love, when you bless those that curse you, what it does is it really brings conviction of the Holy Spirit upon that person. Amen. And you know what, it's a tough thing to live under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, am I right? Amen. So the first thing we got to understand is that um, loving in this upside down manner is not optional. God is the better purveyor of justice than we are. Now, number two, um, we need to understand that the real test of love, loving upside down, is loving those that don't deserve it. Amen. You have not truly loved in your life, you have not truly loved until you love someone who's undeserving of love. And the scripture here is clear. What good is it to love those who love you back? I mean, it's a good thing. It feels good. My wife's very lovable, so it's easy to love her. Stacy's very lovable. Over here, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So it's easy to love those people, but it's not easy to love the punk that keeps tagging my sign out there. Right. Not very easy to love that guy, I'm assuming guy. But Jesus says it clear. Even the tax collectors will love those who love you, love them back. What does he mean by that? Even the ungodly can do that. You see, there's a higher standard of love for us that follow Jesus. Remember, it's upside down. And who's our, who's our best example of this? Jesus, right? Jesus hung on a cross, loving those who were undeserving of love. He died for those who mocked him, for those who spit on him, those who rejected him. And of course, we're not Jesus. Every Thursday night, not every Thursday night, but Thursday night, sometimes there'll be people, I know this is a shock and a surprise, but there are people who come on this property drunk. And sometimes I get a little out of control, and I got to take the pastor hat off, and I got to put the bouncer Dave hat on. And, and the bouncer Dave had, has, had, uh, guy has to, has to escort people off the property sometimes. And so I'll have to, you know, get these guys to, to, to start moving off the property. And it never fails. I'll get them out to the middle of the parking lot and they'll turn around and go, Pastor Dave, Jesus wouldn't do this. <laughs> and, and I'll look at them and I'll say, I ain't Jesus. I'm Dave. You can go off the property and talk to Jesus about it, but here you got to answer to me. <laughs> now, <laughs> we are in a good, <laughs> you see how this, this became a little more revealing about me than all about, than about you guys. Um, <laughs> we are in a constant process, however, of becoming more like Jesus. Amen. And we are representatives of the gospel. And he tells us that, you know what? The world can act one way. We got to act differently than the world. The world acts, they, they, it's easy for them to love people who love, who love them back. For us, we got to love those who don't love us back, who are difficult to love. The people, the people I wasn't going to go there. The people in your life, this is important. The people in your life that have hurt you, how many of you had somebody in your life that has hurt you? I'm sure everybody could raise their hand. Those people don't deserve your love. They don't. They don't deserve your kindness. But Romans chapter 12 tells us beyond just love and kindness, we're supposed to meet their needs. Oh my goodness. But here, here's something important. If, if you want to focus your life doling out hate and bitterness and anger and judgment to those who deserve it in your life, you'll probably find multiple offenders, lots of people who qualify. All of us have multiple offenders in our life, but be warned. If you do that, you'll become bitter, you'll become angry, you'll become judgmental in the process. The problem is that the misery you intend on those who have hurt you always comes back and ends up on your plate. Life is too short to live angry and bitter and twisted. I've seen people who live in hate. They have health problems. They live in misery, all because they've, they, they couldn't release love on the people who have hurt them. While the people who hurt them remained unaffected. I had somebody tell me once, you know what, when you live in 
in misery and anger and hurt over something that somebody did to you, you allow them to hurt you twice. I only needed to hear that once. I ain't letting somebody hurt me twice. You get me? That ain't going to happen. You see, part of the revelation here is that loving upside down, when you love your enemies, when you bless those that curse you, is that it helps you let go. When you heap coals on the head of your enemy, coals of kindness, coals of love, it gives you liberty, it gives you freedom. You're no longer shackled by whatever happened. Come on, that's the revelation here. All right, let's keep moving. Turn in your Bibles back to Matthew. Every time I say I'm going to preach a short message, then it just starts going. I don't know what happens. (laughs) Uh, Chapter 18, verse 21. Now let's talk a little bit about forgiveness. This is, I want to read this entire passage, and then we'll, we'll start to wrap up quick. Um, verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts... One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. That servant went out, found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet, begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And so when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. And then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I have had pity on you? And his master was angry, delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And so my heavenly father will also do to to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That's Jesus talking. That's some powerful stuff. Now here's the first thing, and and, and I think this, this parable makes it so clear is that all of us have to, to, have to come to grips with the fact that we're all deserving of judgment. Come on. All of us have hurt people. All of us should be the recipient of someone else's hate or anger. In other words, you're someone else's enemy. If I had a whole different group of people here, they'd all probably raise their hands about you. Now, I want to be clear and I, and I said this last night, and I don't know what's represented here today. I'm not trying to bring, their, their, if you've been abused sexually or, or, or physically or something like that, I'm, I'm not trying to, to equalize certain things or, or put things on, on equal level in terms of, of that kind of stuff. Um, but the reality is all of us have hurt people, Amen. okay? Um, and it's only through the blood of Christ the, his redemptive work on the cross that all of us have been forgiven. How many times many of us have come to this altar and begged for forgiveness? Maybe from, from seeing things we shouldn't have seen or from saying things we shouldn't have said, we've begged God, forgive me. And yet someone does something egregious to us and we're unwilling to forgive them. One of the most important revelations you can come to in your life is that you are yourself deserving of judgment and punishment from that person who you hurt. But yet God has forgiven us. So realize that we're all deserving of judgment. And here's the last point. This is the toughest one. In order to love upside down, we got to be willing to forgive. Forgive. That's a tough one. Forgiveness is the center of the Christian faith. A lot of people in a lot of churches, in a lot of communities of faith will say, we want to be like Jesus, right? Right? We like being like Jesus, I think, in the more glorified things that he did. We like his 
preaching and his teaching and his healing and his delivering. We like it when he healed the sick. We want to do that. Praise the Lord. We like it when he raised the dead. We'll do that too. We like it when he walked on water. We want that kind of power. We like the leadership abilities and the style he showed with the disciples. We like his preaching style, how he, how he told stories. We love that stuff. And we walk around trying, to, trying to, to, to mimic Jesus in those things. But you know what? If you're going to be a true follower of him, you've got to do what he did best. And that was forgive. Amen. When he was beaten, he forgave. When he was spit upon, he forgave. When he was falsely accused, he forgave. That's the message of the gospel. And many of us are willing to receive it for ourselves, but we're unwilling to give it and release it on other people. If we want forgiveness, we have to be willing to forgive. And that's what really Matthew 18 is about. If we refuse, then we really haven't grasped our own need for forgiveness. That's why we got to keep our eyes on the cross. That's why you have to keep your eyes on what Jesus did for you. On your need for a Savior. Because when you do that, then you know what? Some things can start to look pretty minor. <laughs> Am I right? Thomas Watson, a 17th century preacher, wrote in the 1600s, a very interesting statement. He said, we need not climb up into heaven to see whether our sins are forgiven. Let us look into our hearts and see if we can forgive others. Amen. If we can, we need not doubt that God has forgiven us. Forgiveness is a difficult thing, and I'm not trying to minimize it, that the, the things that have, that have been done to hurt you, releasing forgiveness on those who have betrayed you, stabbed you in the back, done terrible things to you is, is probably the most difficult thing that you can do in your life. But it really will release you. It really will free you. Forgiving is a better alternative than holding a grudge. Amen. The alternative to forgiveness is in the end a ceaseless cycle of hurt and bitterness and anger and resentment and self-destruction. Holding on to resentment and anger only hurts one person, you. Amen. It doesn't hurt the person that did bad things to you. And that's the whole point of what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 5. When he said, love your enemies. When he said, bless those that curse you. It wasn't just to give us something difficult to wrestle with. It was because he knew there was freedom in it for us. We don't have to live shackled by that stuff. So, to love upside down, to love our enemies, blessing those that curse us, doing good to those who do bad to us, praying for those who have evil intentions for us. As difficult a challenge as that is, as much as it goes against everything that we're wired to think, true freedom really exists in understanding and applying it to your life. Now, just quickly, I want, to, I want to pray, and I just want you to respond real quick. Maybe we're going to take communion in, uh, during the wedding ceremony. And uh, you know what? It's important that before you take communion, you release that stuff. Really. It's important that you not be holding anything against a brother or a sister. And so, as I pray, and I'll give you a chance just to raise your hand and, and, and respond. I'm not going to call anybody to the front. But... You know what, take this moment, and even if it's just the beginning of a process, I say this a lot, but you know what, it's important for me to say, I, I think many times in, in church circles and, and communities of faith, we think that the only real spiritual way for things to happen is bam, like that. And there are times that happens, but there are times that um, that decision that you make is the beginning of a process as well. Neither one is more spiritual than the other, okay? So you may be here and you may go, I can't even grasp ultimately forgiving this person. But you got to start somewhere. And so maybe today it's just a matter of raising your hand and going, I'm going to start that process. Or maybe you've been going through a journey. And today is the icing on that cake. And, and you know what? I told the story. I tell the story a lot. I'll tell it again. I told it last night. I have this little scar right here on my, on my hand. You can't see it because it's been starting to fade. But um, I got that scar when I was a teenager. I worked in a deli um, in a meat department. And we had a chicken rotisserie. You've seen those things that they cook chickens on, right? And so I, I was the guy that had to go and put the chickens on the rotisserie. And this one day, I put my chickens on the rotisserie, and my hand hit the rotisserie, and I burnt my hand, burnt my hand right there. It was the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. 
oh, it was terrible. And it blistered and, and all, all kinds of stuff. And then it scabbed and it hurt, but then the hurt went away. And, uh, and then it became a scar. Now I can touch it, it doesn't hurt, and I can actually tell you the story, right? Because I still have something there that reminds me about it. You know, um, sometimes I think we think forgiving means forgetting. It doesn't mean forgetting. It means allowing something to heal, allowing it to become a story, okay, that we can testify and, and tell other people about, but when we touch it, it doesn't hurt anymore. See, that's, that's what forgiveness does. Um, and here was the cool thing, or the other part of that story. About six years ago, seven years ago now, when I was just getting ready to leave Flowing Wells, I went and got a part-time job at Bash's in the deli. And what do you think one of the first things they had me do was? Go put chickens on the rotisserie, Mr. Ferrari. And I'm like, no problem. And so I got the chickens all loaded up, and I went, and I went, whoa, whoa, hold on. I got the gloves on. <laughs> okay. All of it came back for a second. And you know what? That scar and that memory protected me from doing it again. It didn't hurt anymore, but it sure did remind me of the pain, and I made sure I didn't experience that pain again. Okay? So, so understand what forgiveness really does. It's not just forgetting. It's not letting anybody off the hook, really. What it's about is allowing something to heal so that it can become a story and it can warn you against future pain and when you touch it, it don't hurt no more. Amen? Amen. So let's pray.